hear that. We're, we're great. Okay. So, uh, all right. It's just that little thing popped up on the screen. Well, greetings, everybody. Good evening here. We had a few technical difficulties. Sorry, it's running a little behind, but I, I'm a fast mover for the most part. So I will try to catch us back up here and I will reactivate my screen uh, camera at the end. And then if there's any questions, I will be happy to answer them about the project. So uh, anyway, um, like she said, I've been here at Patuxent River Park over 40 years now, and it really is one of the wondrous places in the state of Maryland. If, if many of you may have been here, but if you haven't been here to Jug Bay, Patuxent River Park, there's two Jug Bays, by the way. There's Jug Bay Wetland Sanctuary on Anne Arundel side, and on the Prince George side is our park, Patuxent River Park, and it's called Jug Bay Natural Area. Well, one of the key features about this location is the wild rice, you see, and the, the bird, the Sora, two, two things I've worked on intensively over the last um, 30 plus years. Um, they're very intimately connected, these, these two, the plant and this bird, and as are some other birds, but this one in particular. So I call it, you know, successful restoration of the wild rice and how it came to be by originally studying the Sora Rail, Porzana, Carolina. So this bird, I'm sitting in right now in a building that was uh, built specifically to hunt Sora Rails. And it was built around 1890. And I'll show you some pictures of it. So I'm gonna proceed first here. Let's, let's go forward, make sure everything is uh, moving as I want it to. Okay, all right. We went to the next slide, everybody, right? All right, perfect. Okay, well, for those of you who haven't been here, looking at the map gives you a little idea of where our location. The river, Patuxent River, is the longest river completely in the state of Maryland, about 115 miles long from start to finish. It begins, as you can see, kind of up there where uh, Frederick and Carroll counties and Montgomery all come together, and there's two other smaller branches, middle and little Patuxent, that join in and eventually come all the way down here. You see where the little arrow points to and a blow up of the box. That is uh, Jug Bay. And you can see our Patuxent River Park, which is about 2,000 acres uh, here on the Prince Georgia side. We have almost 8,000 acres protected on the Prince Georgia side of the river uh, for the entire 55 miles of that river border. So um, basically half of the river essentially borders the uh, western, uh, the eastern side of Prince George's County. So the wild rice, as you can see in these pictures, these are the largest freshwater tidal wetlands in the state. They're, it's extremely diverse. There's just no other place quite like it with the, the amount of plant diversity. But the wild rice in particular, you can see grows in that almost a monocultural stands where, and the production, the amount of biomass that it produces is absolutely tremendous here. There's not many plants in nature that could even equal it, let alone even surpass it. Here's a little bit closer view to show you as the, our, our park in this upper portion is 2000 acres. Then there's the Merkel Wildlife Sanctuary right adjacent to us, bordered by Mattapanai Creek. That gives us here 3,500 acres continuous, over five miles of shoreline protected between our organization, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and Maryland Department of Natural Resources. So right now there's thousands of geese flying by outside the building here in the dark. I can hear them. There, many of them are beginning to migrate and I've heard more tonight than I've heard at any recent time. So I think some of them are moving out of here with this south wind and these warm temperatures, very unusually early. So here you can see we're also a National Estuarine Research Reserve under NOAA. And you can see that outline in green um, so we have the Park and Planning Commission, NOAA, and Maryland DNR all teamed together to create this reserve system, which is really unique. Only one of 30 places in the entire country have this designation. And because of its unique features, the wild rice, the large population of birds, and the, the diversity of this freshwater wetland, that's why it qualified for this. And every year they've been supporting quite a bit of the work that I do here, either through the rails or other bird research and particularly the wild rice restoration. So the, the, one of the great things about Jug Bay is that the salinity generally is less than 0.1 part per thousand on average. So it's barely detectable, the salinity, but yet there is some here. But if you go down to the bay, it's 15 parts per thousand. So it's many times uh, higher salinity, but I have seen ours increase during a drought year 
all the way up to about three, maybe even close to four parts per thousand, which is astronomical. That's you know 40, 40 times what it normally would be. But that does happen where we've had barnacles here, but that's because of droughts and because we are tidal. The tidal action will bring in salinity from the lower part of the river, even though Jug Bay, as you see in the middle of this picture, that wide natural opening that is 45 miles from the Chesapeake Bay going south. Here you're looking at some of the major, main major wetlands. There's an old railroad bed I'm highlighting down the middle of the picture that was built the Chesapeake Beach Railroad in 1895 that crossed the river and went from uh, Sea Pleasant, Maryland out to Chesapeake Beach. It's a getaway for the weekends. Here's a Western Branch, a large major tributary into the main uh, channel of the river. Um, when you're looking here from north, uh, toward Route 4 bridge across as you're looking south toward Jug Bay, you see the all the light green areas I'm kind of highlighting along the edges. This is at the peak of the wild rice bloom. This is one of those characteristics that make this area so special, that it is unique in the state because these are the largest freshwater tidal marshes containing the most wild rice that occurs in the state of Maryland. Um, it has declined tremendously, and I'll get, get into that here shortly. As you go up north of those marshes, about three miles, the forest is suddenly takes over for open marsh wetlands. You become uh, a more flooded, uh, floodplain forest that occasionally will fill in, but it once was wide open marshes, some of them uh, another 10 to 15 miles north of here. And so that's how much it's sedimented in over the last four centuries. Um, here you can see just some other aerials and some ground views I've taken. The, the diversity and the beauty of this area, I, I can't tell you how many countless sunrises and sunsets I've spent out on this river. Um, you can see some skies and colors that just don't even appear natural or even real. They're so incredible, but these are truly what they look like, unretouched photos. You see the one to the top left, that is the open area on a high tide. Uh, that uh, looks like it's I think it's in the early spring or late, you know, the red, look at the vegetation, things haven't greened up yet, but um, that's our area. My office is right, I'm coming to you from right over here on the left side of this picture. Well, over, all, over 315 species of birds and still counting, still adding, I just revised the list. It's one of the highest lists for any one uh, area in, to go and see in Maryland in, in a particular part. These beautiful foggy, misty mornings, you come out here in the fall when the, the temperatures are beginning to fall off in the morning, the water's warm, creates these beautiful fog shrouded mornings, and you'll see the wild rice silhouetted against that early sun just poking through the heavy fog clouds. And like I said, this is one of the most diverse wetlands you'll find in the state. Because it's fresh, more plants can grow, and most of these are annual seed producing plants that produce an incredible amount of valuable high carbohydrate seeds. And that's what birds are seeking. Migrant birds in particular uh, come through here, red winged blackbirds and the rails and others and waterfowl that I hear out here tonight, they uh, come here to feed on some of these plants. Now, after the major bloom and peak of the biomass in August sometime, late August, early September, then by late September, you see this flower blooming. It's called Burr Marigold or Biden's Labus. It's a beautiful tick seed sunflower that dots all over the marsh. Locals used to call it butterweed. There was so much of it. The marsh was a beautiful butter yellow, uh, yellow, yellow butter color, butter yellow color. And there are often thousands of monarchs in this plant during the fall migration. It's really incredible to see. Uh, of course, they decline quite a bit, but they still are very numerous. And the interesting thing is it's almost like it has a symbiotic relationship, this, this, uh, this yellow flower with the rice. As the rice declines, it grows in almost exactly the same location, it has the same requirements. But until the rice begins to deteriorate, as you see here, and, and sometime in mid to late September, then the sun can get to these plants and they explode in growth. So over literally in about two to three weeks, goes from nothing visible to suddenly it's the dominant plant out there. Uh, birds like the osprey. I was out uh, last all last week putting up osprey nest platforms and trying to get them ready. We've actually had ospreys seen in the area, highly unusual. I usually don't see them till sometime around March 7th or 8th. Um, but this year, bird, a bird was sighted in the area. As early, it was on the 9th of this month, which is way ahead of normal, about a month 
So obviously this is gonna go down as one of the warmest winters we've ever had on record. And the ospreys seem to sense that and are beginning their migration into the area. So they are, I have about 72 osprey nest platforms up. In the summertime, I go out and take groups out, the public and others, students, and we tag these young ospreys. You can see the young lady here holding one in her hand that I'm giving her to, to why I put the bands on it. One in the nest and an adult over here, you see. And the bands help me track them. I've had some last as long as 22 to 23 years out here. Uh, the record for North America is about 28 years. So any osprey over 8 to 10 has already beaten odds to go beyond that. So here you see um, the great uh, also wood ducks. The wood duck is really one of my favorite birds to work with. We have about 150 boxes out here. We usually hatch in a good year as many as a thousand ducklings out of our boxes spread out over about 15 to 16 miles of the river. So their their scientific name, Aix sponsa, Latin translates to water, water, water bird and wedding dress. So they really have that beautiful nuptial plumage and it's typically the only duck you would find here. Hence the name summer duck that many people call them. Uh, a lot of the old timers that were here that used to hunt them, that's what they call them because you didn't see other ducks here. Here you see a nest box down the bottom right corner with the female. Only the female goes in these boxes. The male never goes in. He, he will stand by while she investigates the cavity and uh, eventually she'll lay up to 15 eggs in that box. Um, some of the other unusual birds in the top left over here is a least bittern, which is part of we're part of the Maryland IBA or important bird area under Audubon. And that is a species of concern in Maryland, the smallest of the heron family. You can see the size of it right sitting on the cattail. And here's a nest below it of a female sitting on her cattail nest, a little woven basket with young babies that just hatched and has a little canopy she creates over it to keep predators and rain off the nest somewhat. Of course, the bald eagle has gone from being rare here to we see, I, I, I see them right outside my window now, sometimes seven, eight or nine of them flying back and forth or sitting in the trees. So I remember when they were a rare sighting, but they are booming and I just saw a few new nests. So we have at least 10 nests in the right around the Jug Bay and vicinity. Of course, the osprey, Bird, rare birds like this red-throated loon I've seen here. This is an Arctic nesting bird that extremely rare in land, usually only found around the coast, around Ocean City or Delaware someplace. Great Blue Heron is kind of a symbol of the park. It's on a lot, it's on our main gate. It's been on our business cards, but the Great Blue Herons nest, you know, the largest of our herons, and uh, they, uh, they breed in large colonies. I've seen up to uh, 150 nests in some of the colonies here on the Patuxent River. Uh, great egrets, they, they don't really breed here yet, but every year I've noticed more and more of these coming in. So um, there are many, many herons are, are booming, you know, here. Uh, let's see here. It's, I keep getting some little pop-up captions here that are at the top of my screen. It says, uh, somebody has closed caption on there, I guess, but I think most people are in now. It's been asking me to admit uh, other people, but uh, I'll keep going. Um, here is a Virginia rail, one of the other species that I that is a very important part of the wetlands here, but not near as much as this one, the Sora. You saw the, the Virginia rail has a long beak made for picking up invertebrates and probing for worms in the mud. The Sora has a small short bill, which acts as a tweezer, which is more ideal for picking up small seeds like the wild rice and smart leaf weeds or polygonums. Their, their scientific name you see, Porzana Carolina. They're often referred to as the Carolina rail. That's probably one of the first places it was described uh, centuries ago by early naturalists in this country. Um, it's, it's the most abundant of the North American rails at about nine species that regularly occur here, but it has the longest migrations known of any of them. Some of them going all the way from Canada, uh, even the Northwest Territories, almost to Alaska, all the way, some of them as far as Peru, which is really amazing in South America. So many of them winter in there. So the Sora and this, the Canada goose, Branta canadensis, this is a, these two birds combined with this bird, the red-winged blackbird, one of the most common birds in North America. These three together are very, the wild rice is very important to them, but at the same time, they all have differing impacts, some of it quite great in terms of the Canada goose and the, uh, and the red winged blackbird, which comes in here in the millions during the fall migration. They used to even hunt those, and you know, you've heard of uh, blackbird, you know, 420 blackbirds baked in a pie, that's what they were talking about usually is a red wing. 
they were eating because they eat this wild rice. The wild rice is such a good plant, high carbohydrate seeds that these birds are seeking out to complete their long distance migrations. And here's a shot I took about 30 years ago. Uh, this was a slide that I scanned in. This really encompassed what the wild rice means to the river. As far as your eye can see down along this edge is a bright green glow. And these are the flowers at the peak of bloom sometime in, in early August, usually around August 8th, it hits its peak of the bloom. So if you come here ever to see it, go kayaking and get out here and see this because this is one of the spectacles to me of nature to see this. And here it is right here in Prince George's County and Anne Arundel counties. You can see the largest stand of wild rice in the state. And it, it really, people used to call it wild oats and uh, other names, but it, it, there's nothing like this rice in terms of energy. The, oh, let me go a little bit further. So each of those seeds in the hand here are little power packs I describe of nutrients. Many micro and macronutrients are found in each of those seeds. The wild rice can produce that this is one of the amazing things, over 40 million seeds per acre weighing over a ton. So one acre of this rice is producing easily a, a ton of seed. So imagine the, 100 acres of it is you're talking easily 100 tons or more of seed produced for birds and other animals to eat it. Here's you can see the seeds that generally have about 600 or so on each panicle or seed head. The, the, it was so important to the Native Americans here. The, some of these local Patuxent Indians, they spoke Algonquin and they called it manamin. Our, our scientific name for it is Zizania aquatica. Um, and it's not really a rice, but it is not a true rice, like Oriza, the rice that most of the world eats. It is, it's not, it's an aquatic grass that produces a rice-like seed. But their name, Manoman, translates to the harvesting berry. And, and it was, a, even though it's not a berry, there's other loose translations of it, but that's one of the main ones. But they considered it a gift from the Great Spirit. And it was a big part of, especially of Great Lakes uh, Indian tribes there. This was a very, very important plant and still is today. It's, it's sacred to them. And you see this bird here in the middle. This is a Sora. Here's one walking over here on the mudflat looking for seeds. And he, right here, you see one that I had dissected, a bird that had died. It, inside of it is absolutely loaded with brown and yellowish fat. And this is literally like looking at the inside of a, of a gas tank. This is their gasoline, essentially. If you converted that to, to kilocalories, there'd be enough fat there, probably a bird that could fly possibly two to 3,000 miles just on that fat. If it was a human, you'd say, oh, this person's going to die of heart disease. But this bird has put this on in a matter of weeks feeding on the rice here. It's really an incredible thing. So the wild rice, just to show you some of the varieties found throughout uh, e eastern here, North America, you can see there's four varieties throughout North America. Zizania palustris is the one you'd buy in the store that's from the Great Lakes region. That's northern wild rice. Ours is Zizania aquatica. Uh, there's a couple varieties of it. And then there's a Texana, Zizania texana that only grows down here in one area in Texas. But it grows, you can see, in great abundance of the Zaya Aquatica all along this east coast, all the way down to the Gulf Coast. And the, because the birds nest up in some of these northern marshes, this is a really important plant to them as they're making this trip going south. So as I said, the wild rice grows in very uh, monocultural stands where there's, it's absolutely so dense that you literally could stand there five feet away from me in it and I couldn't see you. Its height sometimes is 10, 12, I've measured it as high as 13 feet. It's the amount of nutrient that this plant takes up. I cannot under, under uh, estimate or, uh, or tell you in any way, shape or form that this is one of the most important values of the plant. It absorbs nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus from the water that would otherwise cause algal blooms and uptakes it and the plant will grow at its peak during midsummer as much as two inches or so a day and, and reaching these heights of 13 feet. It's a tremendous amount of nitrogen. It, it's helping to keep the water quality good. Here's an example showing you up to, up to sometimes uh, 600 stems we've counted in one square meter. 
I mean, it, the one plant can branch into multiple killers, they're called, but it's, it's unbelievable how dense this plant can be. So these red wings arrive here. They start, you start to see them coming. They're, they're nesting here all year, but they're just scattered through the marsh. By late summer, they're arriving in the thousands and then hundreds of thousands and, and even millions. And they come here and feed on this rice. They've been doing it for thousands of years, maybe longer to coming here, as long as the rice has been part of this ecosystem, which is, goes back probably till at least the last ice age, 10, 11,000 years ago, and uh, then these wetlands form. But many birds like this waterfowl, blue winged teal in particular come here, the green winged teal, they're, they're the smaller of our ducks, but that they love wild rice and they flock in here. Sometimes you'll see, you know, one to 2000 of them out here. And of course the Sora, one of my favorites, and because I was telling you sitting here in this building, it really intrigued me for years of, of being here and about the history in this old gun club. I always think about with the walls can only talk and many famous people from DC and other power brokers have been here. So the SOAR, you can see the range of them. If you look at this map I have here, the, the range goes all the way up to, it just, it says Alaska line, but they actually now are, are in Alaska breeding, maybe because it's getting milder. Um, but you can see they, they nest just north of Maryland in Pennsylvania north. They're not as numerous there. Maryland is really the migration state. They rarely winter here, but they, it's becoming more frequent with these mild winters that we're seeing sightings of them in the Maryland, Virginia area during winter when they shouldn't be down here in the lower Gulf Coast. Florida is a big wintering area. Here's Bermuda out in the ocean. Bermuda, I even have a tracking tower set up out there, 600 miles from the coast of North Carolina, not only for the SORS, but for other uh, species that use the special tracking system we're using. I'll talk more about it. But their migration is closely tied to that rice, wild rice maturation. They kind of time it out. So the, the Algonquin term, the Indians here in this area use this term, Manu Manikashin, which means the one who shows where the rice is ripe for harvesting. So this, they knew there was a connection that this even hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, they knew that this bird had some connection to the plant. And so, because they knew when the Sora arrived, they, they often explain the story because they didn't know of night migration. So they thought the birds came in under the, um, it, it, well, didn't come in overnight like we know now, but they thought that the frogs they heard that make a similar sound burrowed into the mud and metamorphosed into the bird and it came back out because they, as the frogs disappeared in the fall and stopped calling, these birds began to arrive. So here you can see the, the males typically have a bright yellow bill with this black mask. Uh, sometimes it extends in some of the adults. These are adults pictured here, probably a male and a female here, I think. And, um, but that, that bill is perfectly designed for picking up these small seeds. They live mostly in cattail marshes. They love to be in cattails because that cover lasts year round. It, it doesn't completely decay like the rice does. The rice, they're in it when it's here. But when the rice declines by late September, early October, they're in the cattails. That's where I trap them quite often when I'm catching them for research, for banding and for the radio telemetry. This is a juvenile bird. You can see the black mask is coming in, but it mostly has brown on its chest. The gray is just starting to come in. Their toes are about a quarter of their body length. The toes um, allow them to walk on the mud in the marsh with like, like you having snowshoes on in deep snow. They, it distributes their weight. They can walk on one blade of grass on the surface of the water and skip along like nothing. They're excellent divers. They swim really well. They're totally adapted to an aquatic environment. As I said, up here in the corner, here is the, a newspaper I have a copy of from the Library of Congress. A friend of mine who worked there found this for me. It says, Washington hunters hearken to the call of the wild. That's September 1908. So that is a picture of our building that I'm sitting into right now. Here is a picture I took of it a year ago, just showing you from the same angle, basically. So this is over, you know, 114 years later. And here it is still standing. And now I sit right up in one of these office windows. But it shows you all famous people and well-known uh, this is anecdotes concerning well-known people, people like Teddy Roosevelt, Babe Ruth, even, even uh, uh, um, Franklin Roosevelt came here before he had uh, polio. Many, if they didn't hunt, they came here at least to socialize with others. This painting you see here at the bottom, this is by Thomas Aikens from 1874. 
um, a painting he did of rail hunting, pulling through the, the fallen wild rice in the fall, probably in October, the way it looks to me in that picture, um, up in the marshes of the New Jersey, uh, a Morris River, I think in New Jersey, an area where it's similar to here. And over here, you see a picture of a basket of soras, all picked clean, plucked, for, and it says ready for market. This is an actual uh, drawing done and uh, I think it was a lithograph that was a, a Patuxent River from a magazine around late 1800s of polling in the marshes here on the Patuxent River. Here you see a Sora flying. You see red-winged blackbirds by the hundreds above the, the shooter and a guy pushing the boat, the skiff, and laying here at his feet are some more rails here. Uh, and they're going through wild rice, polling through in that basket. A basket like that would sell for about 25 cents for a dozen in a market, which was a pretty good price. And back then, 100, 100 and some years ago, and uh, they were very prized. That was before, you know, outlawed wild game like that being sold, wild migratory birds. Here, this is even going, back, this is a lithograph from way back, probably around 1850s. And these are probably three enslaved guys, young men out here at night hunting. This is represent at night, even though it looks like daylight. There's a sore, they're burning a torch. They learned this from the Indians on the front of the boat. The Soras fly into the flame. They flush them. Here's one here in the marsh just below them sitting, and here's two more roosting in the grass. So these birds would flush and go toward the flame, and they'd swat them down with paddle or a stick. No gun required. But here he is holding one in his hand. The boat is piled high with Soras and boats in there. I've, I've read counts of 80 dozen killed like that by one boat with three men in a night. I mean, eight, nine, eight or 900 birds at least. It's hard to believe. They were super, super numerous. They're nothing like that today. They're not in danger of extinction, but they're definitely not anywhere near like they were. Here, Brooke Meanley was one of the guys that really inspired me to do this work. He was a real mentor of mine. He's been gone for quite a few years now. He was in his 90s. But when I met him in his probably late 70s or in 80s, he took, I went, got him out in the marsh and he wrote this book called The Marsh Hen about the clapper rail. But it inspired me to want to do this work. And a well known Maryland naturalist and artist, John Taylor, who did that drawing, was good friends with him. And I was fortunate enough to know him. And here's a painting that he, he sold the brook of a Sora in the rice. And then you see uh, he gave that to me before he passed away. He mailed it to me from Maine. But he said that you could spend a career doing this. And when I was in my 20s, I scoffed at it. And here I have spent a career studying a bird, that, a very secretive species that very little was known. And so there's been, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing here, but I just wanna tell you that because of the loss of these wetlands, there's been a huge push to study secretive wetland birds because of the decline. You know, uh, there's 143 species in the world of rails and most are declining, many are declining or near extinction. So there've been very little banded recoveries for soars. That was one reason. And the numbers dropped dramatically here in the late nineties when I was trapping. And uh, after 18 years, I shifted gears when after these rails declined in around 98, 99, I shifted gears to working on restoring the rice because the rice was de declining. So anyway, here I was in 1987, uh, setting up my first traps here you know, 35 years ago, setting up a trap in the wild rice. You can see I'm about six foot three and I've been over here, but you see the rice tops towering over me. They're, they're 10 to 12 feet high right here. And the rice, I'm putting a, installing a trap that I got the idea from Brooks' book about trapping clappers. Here's Boy Scouts helping me. I'm standing here. We're putting in a fence to guide the birds into the trap out there. The river's right where that boat is out there. That's two of my assistants were out there. And here's the trap with the rails in it. And we developed a solar powered sound system, digital. It was probably one of the first in the world used for this reason back in 30 years ago. That was new technology, really was barely in answering machines. And we've had tremendous success catching more here than anybody else has done in North America. Over 6,000 now we've captured and banded. So we get in a trap, we put them into these little boxes that we can carry them around in and label where they came from with the, on top of it. I've had many, many uh, people working on this over the years. Some paid like these assistants, men and what young men and women working on this, getting who want to get into this field. You can see we do other things also the ospreys, the barn owls. Um, there's a least better and just a wide variety. So they've all contributed. Many of them now are working in the field, uh, doing something related to conservation biology or, or other uh, you know, topics. 
So here's one of the first sores I caught in 2017 when I revived the project. And you can see um, here was Chelsea and here's Matt. The two of them were working with me on this. We'd capture, band, and then release these birds back to where we caught them. Um, I had a grad student uh, 30 years ago working with me. She did her master's on this project and we developed a new, better technique to catch these birds in a way that had never been done. Many people have utilized this uh, technique we developed using these specialized traps that Brooke could uh, inform me about and we, we just further modified them. This is a king rail she's holding, which is a rare one to catch here and a yellow rail, which is even rarer. That's probably the only one ever captured here at Jug Bay extremely unusual species to see here. Uh, here's another look at it. Coast Coturnicops Novobora census scientific name. And here's an Albino Virginia. This is like a one in a million. You almost never see this, but this bird, uh, a white version, here's the normal one. No pigment in the eye, the bill, the feet, the feathers anywhere. How this survived, I don't know to get to that point because that's a bird completely depends on its camouflage. Here's a couple close-ups of it. Even the toenails were white without pigment, which is pretty remarkable. The eye was pink, just like a, a white albino guinea pig with a pink eye. We released it back out there. Some of the other bycatch, there's a rusty blackbird. This is a species that has declined more than 80% in the past 40 years that, that live in these marshes during fall migration. Uh, swamp sparrows, uh, marsh wren, uh, a common yellowthroat, all species we were catch in our traps just incidentally. Uh, snapping turtle, uh, northern water snake, red invasive red swamp crayfish. I didn't even know we had these until we started catching them. Somehow they got in here and she's holding three pretty large bullfrogs in her hand and making a bullfrog face holding one, uh, three of them. That's unusual to catch those in there. We also do a lot of education programs where we take, uh, this is a, was a, a kid's day in the country years ago out here at Jug Bay Wetland Sanctuary. And I did some demonstrations of Soros uh, showing them Virginia Rail. And, um, and Gene Michael Haramus, Mike Haramus worked with me. He was a USGS biologist at the Tuxet Reach Wildlife Research Center. He and I teamed up to really do some innovative wildlife uh, tracking using radio telemetry. Here you can see a bird, there's the antenna trailing behind it. Here you can see an X-ray I have of one that has the band on its leg, the transmitter's attached using an elastic thread that we uh, found that worked great. And here I have a Yagi antenna that I could track them from the air in the marshes. And many of the birds flew from here in Maryland the first night down to here near Charleston in these massive wetlands you see pictured here. This is, this is a typical flight, about 400 to 500 miles in one night is not unusual. Some of them actually made it to Florida and even as far as the Bahamas in one night. We used a new sophisticated system that we didn't have then, but when I restarted it in 2017, after laying off for 17 years, um, the, the, when the rice had come back, this is why I decided to uh, enter, join this system called MODIS, and this is a sensor gnome, and it uses newer technology, these little flower shaped things you see are shows each one petal represents a antenna in the direction it's pointing and the range of it. So there's a network of them now all the way down from Canada. And you can see the growth of the network from 2017 to 2020. Uh, it's grown a lot. There's now it's really filled in. If you go to 2023, which I haven't had a chance to add yet, it's really expanded. But everybody can pick up other people's birds on the same frequency they each have a digital code that separates them out so it would consist of a little array of yagi antennas there's two different types for, here's two different frequencies solar panel this one's at acetate and the system is inside this box to protect it from the weather and that's what it would look like inside their small raspberry pi computer and radio called fun cubes these fun cube dongles are designed to pick up everything from satellite to the telemetry signals from them. I've had uh, various power companies like Southern Maryland Electric Co-op. They helped us set this one up down at Newtown Next State Park to help us track them from here down 40 miles south. That would show me that the birds were leaving from Maryland into Virginia and continuing their migration. Here you see the elastic thread on one of the transmitters and how the size of it, it weighs about one point uh, 1.5 grams. So they could eat more than this. And a dime, for example, weighs 2.2 grams. So this is less than a dime. It's very light and they hardly know it. We would test them inside and the bird would walk around. We'd see how they were behaved. Behavior was good. Then that's what we, we would take them back and release them where we found them. 
So here you can see these are just a number of tracks that came down here to Florida, to Georgia, and South Carolina. Some went toward the coast, depending on the winds. They usually leave on a northwest wind. Uh, but uh, you can compare this to only 15 band returns from the time about 9,000 sorus had been banded. And we did about you know 6,000 of those here of the whole North America. That's all of the entire continent and over 60 years. So we've learned more in the last five years about their migration. There's one that went to the Bahamas. You can see that long track. It made it over open ocean nonstop and continued flying probably to Cuba or even South America. The winds were perfect. So now turning back, that, that's where we are. I have held another whole presentation about the sort of thing in more detail. I don't wanna go into that because I wanna show you that how the Canada goose, Branta canadensis, and these are resident Canada geese, these, I'm not talking about the wild birds, have greatly impacted the wild rice here over the last 40 years since I've been here. So we ended up doing some studies. When the wild rice disappeared at the time the rail population crashed around 1999, 2000, we noticed there was far less of, of the rice. And if you look here, you can see these resident geese, how this area is pockmarked and bare. There's no rice. Back here in the back, they haven't gotten to it. It's nice and green and thick. Here, they've eaten all the dense plants out of here. Here's later on the plants, as they get bigger, they cut the tops off. And this greatly impacts the growth cycle of the wild rice. It actually makes it where they, the plant will not complete its entire seed producing cycle. Because it's an annual, it won't have seeds to replace itself the next year by these resident geese. Now, these resident geese, where did they come from? People let them go. They didn't naturally stay here. All the migrant geese I'm hearing tonight out here, they're migrating north back to Canada, about 1,500 miles north of here in the Hudson Bay, north end of the Hudson Bay. The Ungava Peninsula is where we know from banding studies, most of the geese go, the wild birds. These giant Canada geese are native to the, the uh, Midwestern in U.S. and Canada. They get up to 15 pounds, which is double the size of the Atlantic ones, birds that we have here. Here's their goslings. There's two as can be, little golden uh, puff balls here when they hatch out. But they join into these groups like you see here, and they graze. Geese are grazers, just like I call them flying cows, essentially. They will eat an incredible amount of vegetation in a, in a day, a group of 30 or 40. If you have 100 or 500 or 1,000, they are devastating. So Mike and I did a study. We switched gears from the rice, excuse me, from the rails to herbivory by resident geese. We did this poster, the loss and recovery of wild rice along the tidal Patuxent River, a National Estuary Research Reserve site. So we talked about too many geese leads to the decline of the rice. The importance of the wild rice, as I've been talking about to these birds, it helps them gain the weight and the fat. It's basically like their gasoline. And two proactive management actions to restore the rice. One was extensive use of protecting fencing and, and planting the wild rice seeds that we collected and seedlings that we transplanted and moved behind the fencing. The fencing was tall enough vinyl coated wire to keep the geese out of it and slow down their aggressive attacks on it and major reduction of the geese by September hunting. Maryland has a hunting season in September specifically for resident geese. There are no wild birds here then. So that's why we do it. And we've had so much success that we've taken out about 7,000 resident geese by allowing the public to hunt them in a very controlled situation. Only two weeks of the entire year, first of September to the 15th none before and none beyond it. We know there are no migrant geese here, but if we didn't, these geese would have literally completely obliterated and wiped out wild rice as a species on this river, which is what they were doing. Here's a group I photographed years ago, just showing you. This little island had been constructed in trees. The geese were living here, resident geese. You notice that the wild rice, I mean, excuse me, the grass has been eaten down to a golf course height. And you notice there's nothing out here, no predators. Over under the trees where it's nice and, uh, well, it, it is greener and protected because the, the geese don't want to go near those trees. They realize the predators could be in there like a fox or something to get, get them. So they stay out here and just graze the, down. Here's another spot I took a picture of them in the 80s. This was where I first, I didn't realize what was happening at first. These geese are standing on mud. The water is inches deep here. These little wispy plants I'm pointing at, these are 
wild rice plants that should be about six to eight feet high. If you look in the background near the trees, here's rice six to eight feet high blooming. This rice is completely almost wiped out. It's, it was a beautiful thick stem like that. I didn't realize that the geese had grazed it down to nothing And when I took the photo. Here's an area where they it was solid. This looked like a lawn normally when it first comes up. Look at how much it's opened up by the geese grazing and all of these plants are clipped off or completely uprooted and destroyed. Here's a leaf scar on one more than six weeks after it was first eaten. The plant is damaged and it affects the growth. It literally sets the plant back. One clipping of the beak of that of those that plant leaves sets it back four to six weeks. If it happens a second time in that period, the plant usually will not produce a, a panicle or seed head. So Mike and I set up these little one meter ex in rings of, of exclosures to keep the geese out. This entire flat you see on, on high tide, this is under two feet of water. So the, this was completely covered with rice. So we put these rings in and then a random, uh, you know, it was randomly and counted the plants inside. We put up a, a post here to simulate where a ring would be and rice would have been all around that. We counted the plants. Well, by the end of the summer, you see inside the wire, the plants are tall and thick. Outside, almost nothing has survived. The entire flat is bare and there's no plants around this, this plastic pipe. So we knew right then it, it's a grazing effect was doing it. We repeated this all over the marsh. This entire area was wild rice and look, by the end of summer, there's two rings. Only what's in the rings are left from the geese instead of a beautiful stand of rice. Here we fenced in a larger area. We put in four miles of fencing. I had hired students do grants through the NOAA to help uh, protect the rice and we seeded it. And you see this green you see is uh, hydrilla or submerged aquatic grass. That's also, that's non-native introduced here, but it has helped the ecosystem in some ways. But you notice there's very little rice uh, other than what those two clumps are. So we instituted two things. One was these hunts allowing the public to come out and hunt these geese in September only. And then we also looked for nests, actively sought them out. This guy's holding a goose back with a trash can lid while the other guy oils the eggs with vegetable oil, um, not something non-toxic to the geese, but it does uh, close the pores up so that the embryos will not develop. We do it early on in there. It's called egg addling. It's very effective. If you take the eggs, the bird will just lay more eggs. You want them to stay on eggs that are not going to hatch, and that's how you, you help curtail the population. But if you don't hunt the adults, you still retain them, and they're still doing the damage. When the rice comes up in April, it it's, grows super slow. This, this picture, Where yeah. did Greg go? Hold on a second. All right. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, yep. You 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 popped off, and now you're back on. Okay. Well, I was saying that, uh, okay, as long as you can hear me. If you don't hear me, just say, speak up. If something happens, say, hey, uh, stop for a second. So wild rice, you see, this is the floating leaf stage. When the rice first comes up, it's tiny little plants germinating first week of April when the temperatures start to stay around 50 degrees in the mud and the water, then uh, it may germinate early. The water's already about 50 now or over. So the plant grows super slow the first few weeks, but by May, it begins to look like this by late May. It's beautiful. Look at that green stand of that as far as you can see. That is after doing the restoration. That is what you want to see after removing the geese. Beautiful stands. But now from this point, May to early June, it grows more than two inches a day for the next six to eight weeks. And it towers over everything in the marsh. So here you can see Mike is standing here with a meter stick. These plants are towering over him. He's reaching up. That's probably over 10 feet right there. And those plants are about 11 or 12 feet tall. Here I'm standing next to some on our dock and they're taller than me. These are already at about seven feet high and you can see them behind the fence. So we've done various things called NOAA Restoration Day where NOAA would bring their uh, volunteers and, and uh, their, their staff out. These are University of Maryland students that were freshmen that had to do a project uh, to do something beneficial for the environment. We, I took many of them out, hundreds of them over the years. I hire these students over here on the bottom left. They're planting or they're transplanting wild rice in this case. Um, they're going into the mud and pulling plants that are where it's growing dense and we're putting them in tubs, floating them out and then transplanting them into areas we're trying to restore like this. We put up the fences, 
We put the plants in by hand by walking out in that deep mud and then plant them and then you see. So here you can see in this picture, this is after our first planting. These are fences running, like we made various cells of different sizes. Here's one, all these plants are planted here. There are rice plants growing, but it's in this water lilies right here, this clump, the geese can't get to them here, but they easily would swim in here, but they Greg, don't- Greg, we want... lost you again. It did? All right, all right. Well, I'm let me- I've hearing your mind the whole time. Yeah, What's doing... that? I yeah, Greg, you're fine, you're Greg, fine. Maybe okay, I'm okay. Sure. okay. Yeah, all right. Here. So this is one of our main study areas. We fenced this in and you see, here's a better view from the air I took of the rice of the fence. This really worked beautifully to exclude the geese and we close them in and they don't like to get in fenced in areas with this four foot high wire fencing. It keeps them out, but we leave gaps for other animals like muskrats and turtles. They can get around or through them, but these, the, the, these are all plants we planted in there. Here we also collect the seed in the late summer with these bags. And we put these bags of Tyvek that we had to create, make them, cut them and, and tape them together with Tyvek, you know, house wrap material, because the birds, the red wings could peck through it. Here's seed that we collected. I have gallons and gallons of it stored in the fridge. It has to go through a cold cycle before it'll grow. Every year I would do aerial photos at the peak of bloom when you can see the flowers blooming. Look at the rice here. This is after the restoration. We also have been doing management of Phragmites, spraying the Phrag uh, in the late fall when everything else is dead. And then you kill the Phragmites off when it's active. And now this has been fantastic. The rice and everything has been coming back. Here's an example in 93 when the rice was just beginning to vanish. This is all rice in here. You can see this light green, same spot. And look, there's no rice left in here. It's only water lilies, which they don't eat. The water lilies have very little food value. Here's patches of rice coming back all along the edge. The lilies, again, are this green or brown. They're stained brown from the, uh, from the mud sediment. Here's an area that looked like when we had the one meter rings that Mike and I were out there with them. Here was a patch we put in and wired around it. Look how there's nothing out on this mud flat. That's shallow. That was that big flat. The only rice is growing along the edge where the geese don't like to go near the woods and where we enclosed it. Same area below, that is about two years later, fenced in. Look at the rice, how it filled that entire flat back again. Here's another area of the main study area. This is all the bottom corner, left, bottom left is all rice that now has filled in those gaps. Here's fencing, rice plants. Look at it here, you see a year later, how it's filled in with rice that we planted there. That's right by our dock. There's a layer of the fences. This is rice, this light green. And uh, you can see it's up to the fence by the following year. So here's one of the main areas. This is 98 when it was almost gone. It's open mud flat. And then look at this seven years later after we fenced and seeded it, completely filling in the exact same location with acres and acres of rice. 2016, this is how good it looked, the last good aerials. This is all wild rice in here by August. It looks tremendous. Uh, here's some patches now on the south side of the channel of the river. The, we've been seeding in here. I'm trying to get, this is all water lily, and this is rice beginning to colonize here and here. So we're trying, it's, what's happened is the sea level has risen so much that it's hard to get it to grow again, the depth in there. And these, these letters identify areas, same areas where the rice is gone, A, B, C, and D at the bottom. That's, you know, this is 93. And then five years later, by 98, when it was botting out, there's nothing. All of this was rice in here, and there's nothing left in here. The geese had completely wiped it out. So that's what I'm showing here. So now you see this area, we've gone from about 50 acres up to about 300 acres now, 350 acres of rice. So um, here's another view of it. It's spectacular from the air, that light green and blooming jumps out at you. This is Jug Bay Wetland Sanctuary over here. Beautiful shot, shows you dark green, all cattails. This is great cover for birds. A lot of them nest here, the soars winter. I don't know where Greg went. Did you? Are y'all still hearing him? Can you all still hear yes. me? Yes, we are. Yeah. I'm about finished here, so, so this is about it. So, Ooh. and again, so the wild rice has really just beautifully, it, this has been one of the best restora restoration projects in the state and they and we've gotten a lot of recognition here for it and uh, the success of it they don't often work projects like this there's a, a aerial survey we mapped it out the red is wild rice you can see in some of the marshes you can see here where it is now that's where it used to be and then here you see 
where it has, you know, it's for, river again, here's the top of the river. It's 46 miles from where we are at the rice. There's none growing down. Look, it, it only occurs in about 12 miles, 15 miles of the river. That's it. That's the rice. That's a blow up on the left. That is what I meant to say. So, and then the statistics at the bottom line, we got down, we measured in 89, 330 acres. And in 99, 10 years later, the geese have reduced it to less 50 acres or less. We think as low as 35 acres. And now you can see how it began to climb. It's now 300. And I think today, when I get it measured again, I'm hoping for new maps. I think there's now going to be about 400 acres. It's increased by probably another 100 acres. So 1976, this is standing outside the building I'm sitting in, wild rice there. Uh, you can see covering most of Jug Bay. That's not something you see much, but it is beginning to come back. And this is the oldest color photo I could find of rice in, uh, doing some research. This is from the Route 4 bridge taken by an old time biologist, Fran Euler. And this marsh is full of rice, which it isn't today, but it is beginning to show signs of returning. He'd written on the slide, uh, you know, some early Kodachrome slide. So, and there's where, this is the area I just showed you, highlighted down here on the right half. That's where that picture was taken from the bridge, looking at this now, there's Phragmites there, there's trees growing there now, there is the, there's rice right there, to, uh, right there. That was a few years ago. There's actually quite a bit more now. It is beginning because of the, we reducing the geese. These are the last major wetlands on the Patuxent River. So, and concluding, how do we maintain the rice for the future? One, when I'm gone, and it's not far away from now, when I retire after you know being here almost 40 years, I probably will try to get to that point in the next uh, two, three years. Uh, monitor and control the geese, maintain fencing as long as needed, continue planting the rice seed in the plants and use aerial or satellite photography to monitor the abundance. And that's what I'm hoping to do. So there's my uh, at, uh, email and phone number. If anybody ever has any questions about it and wants to contact me, you can. Um, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. But as you can see, the wild rice is really a big part of this ecosystem. And I, it really is a lesser place without it. And I see people always say, build it and they will come. Putting the rice back in here and restoring it from its all time low in the late 90s, early 20, 22 years ago, I, I've seen what the waterfowl and what birds have come back from it. The rails have never recovered from the loss of the rice and probably wetland loss. And but like I said, that's another whole story. But that's why I started this study again with some of that new uh, MODIS tracking technology. MODIS, by the way, M-O-T-U-S dot org is a site if you want to explore and learn about it yourself. Uh, but MODIS means in Latin movement. And that's the whole idea. We, everything from monarch butterflies to whales and other things are, can be tracked using this technology, but mainly birds. That's what it is. So. Any questions, anybody? Anybody would like to ask anything about it? Hey, Greg, thank you so much. This was phenomenal. Could you unshare and come back and we'll do Q and A? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me uh, let me unshare. Yes, yeah, stop share. Okay, I'm back here. And let me let me make sure I put a. Uh, Can you see me now, everybody? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, let me know. See, if you look behind me, you see. Uh, here's a here's a the painting I had in the slide of the. Uh, painting of by John Taylor of the Sora. That's like one of my prized things from Brooke Mealy. And I always think of him, remember that, that how he said, hey, it beats sitting in a computer terminal in DC, working out here on the marsh and studying some unusual species. And he was right. I said, I'm sitting in a computer now, but I'm not here all the time. Let's put it that way. I'd, I'd rather be here in, uh, in this beautiful wetland right outside here studying it than, than locked at a desk all the time. And I think that all of us want to be where you are as well right now, and 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 that. So we maybe maybe we should need to come and visit you there I, too. I was going to recommend that. I was going to say that as a group, you should whoever takes the lead on it should get in touch with me, uh, get a feel for how many people you would like to have, uh, how many people you think would be interested. We could do a, a boat tour in the fall when I'm doing some rail trapping late, you know, sometime in maybe September. Um, you could come out and see the rice. Uh, if you want to come sooner, you can. If you want to come and you know see some of the ospreys here, they'll be gone then. It's hard to see everything at one time. You, you, the beauty of this place is that you see changes in it throughout 
the year. Every season brings something new and um, amazing to see it and, and of interest. So that's why I always say to be here year round is the is the ideal thing. So let me see. So if there's I some yeah, there's some questions on here. Nala wants to know if they want. Um, are there is there a place to launch kayaks? Yes, yes, we have um, we have two a couple of boat ramps here where you can kayak launches. So yes, you can bring your own kayak and launch here. Um, that's a, one of the great things. We have kayak, a, a, a water trail here. If you look up patuxentriverpark.com or go to MNC PPC, uh, you can, if you Google Patuxent River Park, you'll find it. But we have sites that you can call and ask about or you can book to go uh, from site to site to site and camp and along the river and really enjoy miles and miles of the of the beauty. Of and Richard, place. Richard asked, what time is the best time to see the rice and the rails? Uh, definitely September, early October. The, the, it, for the rice, the most spectacular time to see it blooming is in uh, August when the flowers are blooming. To see the rice, that we see the birds, you need to come usually in September. They come in on the tail end when the rice is ripened and finished blooming. They begin to come in and that's when I, I would trap them. I, I'm going to do some limited trapping just to show people the birds. Uh, it's more for that. I'm right now in the process of writing it up. I've got, I hired a, a young lady who's got a master's who is a uh, excellent bird researcher and we're working on it, teamed with another one of my assistants to, to, uh, to get this data all published and out there because it's really unique. What we, we have here, some of the information we discovered is, is new stuff to science in, in, in terms of migrating soar rails, so. And what is the goal, Jerry asks, is it 300 to 400 acres or should we keep it going and expand it further? Well, I would love to see it go further, but I think there is a certain limit as, as how far it can go. But there is room for still improvement. There's no question. There could be more. Um, it, I, I, if we could get it to 500, I would say let's do it. But, but it's been a long time since it's been at that amount that you, you could say 500 acres or even more. It had to be a lot more because they killed them here in the tens of thousands. The, the birds were just so super abundant. I've, I've got records. I've found that recently people have given me some old log books and I, I saw where 16, 1700 soars were shot at one of the five clubs here on Jug Bay back in uh, around 1897. So the records go back to like 1897 all the way till about 1960. But most of the action was in the early 1900s, late 1800s. So that's when most of the, the hunting was going on in large numbers. There were no limits on them. I mean, they were kind of like the passage of pigeon. No one believed that would ever go extinct, but it did. And uh, from billions, one of the most abundant birds in history, to nothing. And the Sora probably would have followed them if it wasn't for the fact that it has a super secret of nature and lives in those marshes. They just couldn't get them all. And I think that's one of the, the great things. Edwin so, asks about the symbiosis between wild rice and sunflower species. Is this something that has been tested? Uh, no, it hasn't. But it, it, as I said, it, it appears to have some sort of symbiotic relationship. I don't know if one helps the other, but I will say this, wherever I've gone up and down the East Coast from here to Florida and find wild rice, that plant is growing in it. And when the wild rice was there and is gone, the, the, the plant disappears with it. So I, I don't know if anyone, I haven't seen anything in the literature, but just, just my personal observations makes me think that they not only do they require the same habitat, but that rice seems to protect it somehow. As the geese ate the rice, they they weren't really to me they weren't eating the the burr marigold, but they weren't going up where the where that plant was as much. So that's why I'm saying. But I think it was just the destruction of the rice took away a plant that shielded that uh, burr marigold, the the tick seed sunflower. You, you hear the thing that hitchhikers, you know, you get on your clothing. That's what they are. They're little two pronged seeds, flat seeds that stick. They call them stick tights. The family of plants is called the stick tights. They stick tight to your clothing or animal fur or birds feathers. And that's how they get transported all over the place. But they really are like a little piece of Velcro, the way they stick into your those two little prongs. So, but yeah, that would be an amazing thing. Another thing to study. I've, I've got ospreys, of course, and with so many things I can, there's only so many things I can do. <laughs> but, uh, but and, I really, uh, 
Thank and you, uh, the two questions are kind of similar. Um, are the rails coming back now in the numbers that the rice is coming back? And then Jerry asks, is there any data on the impact of in the increased rice on the bird life and other fauna? Yeah, the, there's no question. As the, the, as the rice has come back, the rails have recovered some to some extent. But I think that a combination of, of climate change events, for example, we know now something we, we didn't know a long time ago was that the, the jet streams are controlled by temperatures in the oceans. So the last three years, we've had an unprecedented, I think one of the only times recorded a, a La Nina condition, the opposite of the El Nino. And it, I've seen some things affecting fish populations, more rain in some areas, fresher water, uh, delays of crabs coming up and, and menhaden for them for the uh, osprey. But I've also noticed that uh, when the, when you get one of these El, El Ninos, the winds flow more west to east, and often we get milder winters like like this one. This one, even though this is La Nina, can cause it too. But it also causes a um, a flow of birds that don't have a safety net under them when these cold fronts coming from the northwest push them out. They depart on those fronts, but they get pushed off land. And when they get over the ocean, if they don't get a, a clockwise circulation, bringing them back into land somewhere down in South Carolina, Georgia, which is what we see there, what's happening, they go out to the ocean, sometimes hundreds of miles, not wanting to go there but they go with what the front provides them, a free ride, a, a boost of tailwinds. A bird that can only fly 30 or so can sometimes achieve 80 miles an hour, we clocked them at with this using this telemetry tracking. 80 miles an hour, a bird that's more than double its natural speed. So they're utilizing that to get to their southern grounds with the least consumption of the food reserve, which is the rice in their fat supply. So I theoretic, my theory is that they can make it from here to South America on what they eat here at Jug Bay, the wild rice. That this they stay here to up to two months, fattening up on it, and that fills their tank to make it all the way down there. So that's why I've set up a number of these towers and utilizing this. That's why I want to get this published because it's really some unique things that we are have witnessed with this project. Yeah, so, and so Richard Richard was asking, I mean, you're going to publish for scientific, but he wants you to write a book on this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I thought about doing a um, some sort of uh, a monograph like Brooke Meanly did on the King Rail. And I, but boy, it's it's a tremendous amount of work. So I'm breaking this work down. We also did DNA sexing. I got a paper right now that's get, we're getting ready to submit for review um, that just finished. That was the first one we did. Uh, and, and now it's ready to be submitted. Now we're working on the migration tracking data, another whole paper. And we also did, you asked, somebody asked me about the birds, did they return? We did sound surveys and I would love to do something with the sound surveys, the, the, the data we collected from now and 30 years ago, comparing the numbers, but just my, my eyeball and ear tells me there's not anywhere near as many here as there was 30 years ago here. They, they have not rebounded with the rice, even though waterfowl have rebounded quite a bit here and we kept the geese in check. The wild geese are out here now. Like I said, I heard thousands of them tonight out here you know, going by, some sound like they're migrating. They don't impact the rice because they leave now in March before the rice comes up a month after they're gone and they don't come back until the rice is already dropped down in the mud, completely done. It's the introduction by humans of those resident geese there used to be as many as 100,000 at least in the state of Maryland, 3 million or more in the whole United States. And they, they, and they don't migrate because people let them go. Where they release them, that becomes their home area. They don't learn the migration like the wild birds. They stay here year round, disrupting the whole uh, marsh wetland cycle. That's the problem with them. Um, you know, people love them, and that's why they brought them here. They bring these big birds, and they brought the Midwestern ones, which were twice as big and eat twice as much. I mean, one of those 15-pound geese could eat two two pounds or more of rice seedlings that were one to two inches long. I mean, they could eat hundreds of them, one bird in a day, and devastate an acre of rice. You know, one or two geese could go in and destroy the little seedlings in April and wipe out a whole patch, and that's that's what happened, essentially. 
um, uh, Greg, Jerry wants to know about the winter habitat um, is, is in the Caribbean and Latin America. Is that impacting the numbers of the ones that are coming? The the soras. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, the soras. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say say it one more time. Is is the uh, the the winter habitat? Are, is it is is the quality of the forage there impacting, or the quality of the habitat there impacting their numbers? I, I would say it, probably so, because many of these islands have become super populated. For example, in Bermuda, when I've spoken to the guys down there, and we set up one of these modus tracking towers, and mo we picked up some interesting birds. We haven't gotten a soar there, but which is you know it's okay. I just thought it, I read some papers that inspired me to put the system because they found that a bird like a, the size of my thumb of black pole warblers flew from Alaska across Canada all the way down through Bermuda nonstop to South America. And a bird that size that weighs a fraction of what a soar weighs, it weighs like a, a, a not even a fourth of what a soar weighs. But this bird is the most efficient vertebrate known on the planet that can fly maybe 20,000 kilometers, not completely nonstop, but they've flown from Alaska all the way down to Brazil in the rainforest. It's incredible. And, you know, we, so I, I was thinking, you know, the SORA does its own version of this, but those birds go through Bermuda. So I thought maybe this would help some of those studies. But Bermuda, if you look at, I have another whole talk that talks about Bermuda and the tracking. Um, Bermuda is literally 21 square miles with almost 400 species of birds have been seen on Bermuda. Prince George's County is 500 square miles, more than like tw more than 20, 25 times bigger, yet our bird list is smaller than Bermuda's. Not by much, but it's, you know, a couple dozen species. It's like 300 and something. So this is what's amazing. This Bermuda is, I call it a lifeboat for birds because so many birds get blown off with these cold fronts and that's how soars end up there. They don't go there intentionally. They're getting carried there, and that's what I, I it, Bermuda literally. There's 3,200 people per square mile. So answering your question, hey, what is what? How do people impact on these islands? So many people packed in there. There's not a lot of places for these birds to go, and that's that's one of the problems. They they're they're finding you know that that dot out in the ocean is very critical for many species that get blown off course. I'm sure hundreds of thousands of birds of multiple species, maybe more than that, maybe millions die over the ocean if they don't have enough food. So bottom line is these soras, if this rice isn't here, they end up not having enough fuel in their tank to make that nonstop flight. When they get pushed off course because of El Nino conditions or La Nina conditions, you start adding up factor, many man induced. Some people don't think so, but you can add all these factors up and realize that, wow, these all of these things combined are really making a, a, a massive difference for migrating birds, all, all different species. So, you know, 70% of the birds in North America are migratory, go to South America or Central America. So that's why uh, the SOAR is one of them. But I, I think just this one study uh, has really uh, uh, opened the doors because it is a very secretive bird, very difficult to study. Yeah, you know, you're looking at the person probably. I, I can I can say probably 100 percent certainty that I've handled more of them probably than anybody alive on the planet. So that's a, just to catch them because they're that hard to catch. And I've spent thousands of hours working on them out in that marsh, and it fascinated me. I and mean, when I was a kid, I always said I want to study something that is unique, that has a reason, a purpose, and look at how uh, wetlands, and wetlands are my favorite thing, wetland ecology, and birds in the wetlands, and every, how everything interacts, and you know that, and I've gotten to do what my dream was when I was 10 years old, so I'm very fortunate, so, but I, I appreciate everything, I, I'm not saying, st stop you, I just want to tell I'm looking at some of the comments, and I, I appreciate all your, your nice comments, everybody, it'd be, it would be nice to have you come in person, I hate doing these Zoom things. I'd much rather be in person to take questions and I, I feel like I can get more interaction. But if yeah. you want to set this trip up for everybody and come see for yourself, it was somebody you want to put in charge of it, contact me sometime and we can talk about it. You got plenty of time. Uh, if you want to see the rice and the beauty come in late August, early September, but maybe you could do both. If you come in early September, you can still see what the rice, it's about a month after the peak of bloom, but the rails are here then and I, might be able to capture one and show you or something like that. But it's well, it, many people lo love to see them. 
Yeah, well, Brett, I think this is the start of a beautiful relationship, and I think that we will be seeing you uh, uh, again because we were, you are a wealth of knowledge and experience that um, we're, we're we just only benefit from. And we're gonna come. I'll be I'll be contacting you um, to to schedule some times that we can come out there and 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 see all of this um, beauty uh, in person. Well, I hope so. And and again, I'm just glancing over. It's hard for me. I recognize a lot of names and people I see. I, it'd be hard for me to call them all out. But I just want to tell you, thank you for all your, your kind comments. And uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, it, the work means a lot to me. It's been, you know, kind of my life's work. Yeah, I look at it and say, that's why I want to get this published and get it finished and maybe do something with the Osprey uh, data that I have. I have almost, you know, 30, 35 well, this year will be the anniversary 40 years ago this July I tagged my first Osprey and that's about 6,000 birds later uh, Ospreys that I've handled and tagged and, and uh, put up many many Osprey nest towers about 72 I have here now we started with one in 79 and I kind of took it over as a project from my old supervisor in Boston now I've, I've added and built it to three and 85 and now here we are you know, 40 years later, almost there's there's 70 pairs. I tagged over 100 young ones just here at Jug Bay, another 150 down river. And uh, we get some as old as 22, 23 years uh, still coming back here, which is ancient. It's like a person living to be 100, you know, for an Osprey to make it to 22 years. But I appreciate all your comments and everybody, all the good things. I'm trying to glance at and see if there's any questions but um i think she's been catching a lot of them for yeah I, I think i captured all of the questions and there's just a lot of appreciation for all of the work that you've been doing um and if there's any way that we can um uh, assist i know that you 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 incur you uh have you're working with schools and they're helping to get um kids to grow some of the, the rice and so it's a it's a it's a uh, all hands um, on deck project, and it's just been an amazing um, uh, ecological restoration success story. And we have so few of those to 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 talk about, and yeah. so we're, we're it's exciting to have one right here in our backyard. So thank you so much um, for all the work that you've done, and thanks for sharing it with us. And we're going to get out there and and enjoy your the, your dust, um, work. I'll, I'll be looking forward to meeting many of you and. Uh, uh, I certainly answer more questions if anybody wants to call. Uh, the number was up there. I guess many of you probably got it if you wanted it, or you my email. You can contact me, or I, you know, I'm happy to talk about it. As you can tell, I enjoy discussing something that I'm passionate about. So uh, hopefully, I'll see a lot of you here at, at some point in the future. Some of you I have seen. I recognize some names, but others uh, certainly I'm, I'll be looking forward to seeing you come and see it for yourself. Because if you haven't. You've been missing out. <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah. Well, everybody, thank you for coming. And um, uh, thank you, Greg. Next week, I believe we're learning about uh, amphibian limb, the limb regeneration um, uh, of uh, amphibians and some some worms from a researcher scientist down at the uh, in St. Mary's. Um, so I hope that you'll join us for that next week. And uh, everybody stay well, stay curious, and stay outside. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Thank you Thank again. You. I appreciate uh, everybody turning out and the good comments. Thank you. I'll see you soon, I hope, sometime this year. Yep. You, you, you can bet on it. Yeah. Right, I'll, I'll look for your call then. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> but good night. night. Thank good you. Night. Good night. All right.